say and spell your uh, name for us? My name is Ed, E-D, <laughs> Bowie, B-O-W-I-E. Great, Just thank Just like you, I was Ed. told to say it. Awesome. E-D, Ed, Ed Bowie. <laughs> Uh, and you work here at AOC, correct? I do. I, I work here at AOC. Actually, I work at, at a coffee shop down the street, but <laughs> I'm employed here at AOC, and, and the outstanding staff does most of the work. Okay. I, so Yeah, I'm associated with AOC. That's why I'm here. Wonderful. Um, tell us a little bit about your background, where you're from originally, and what uh, area you grew up in. Well, the appropriate question is, who's your daddy and how big's the boat? But uh, I was born in Mississippi long enough ago to have forgotten most of that stuff, but I grew up in New Orleans, went to high school through New Orleans, came to UL uh, halfway by accident, and then uh, UL had an effect on me. I did a little time in the service uh, because UL and I didn't agree on my path. Uh, came back to UL having straightened out the Southeast Asia problem, uh, finished from there. And to condense it from there, I have alternately worked. I worked for Harry Connick Sr., the DA in New Orleans for a while, and I worked at the Cajun Dome for a while. I worked at Goodwill for a while. I, run, I ran, uh, own, I didn't run, I, uh, I ran, owned some camera stores for a while back when cameras, you remember cameras that had film and that stuff. Uh, I, I had a camera store and we developed film and all that stuff. And then uh, Cajun Dome, Goodwill. And then by a really bizarre set of circumstances, uh, this AOC thing fell on my lap, and it's been uh, darn near 20 years. Well, let's touch on that a little bit. Uh, you've been here for 20 years, and I'm sure you've had a lot of fond memories. What's your favorite memory of AOC to date? <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow. My favorite memory of AOC. Probably, I, the most positive experience has been my own personal development as uh, becoming much more aware of the community I live in and, and the human beings that, are, that populate this area. I learned a whole lot about myself by learning about other people and interacting and I have touched every kind of person you can imagine here and ultimately they really touch me more than I touch them. The, the human interactions and, and the people that have had the most profound effect on me from here uh, I would never have met anywhere else. That I don't associate with those kind of people. I don't run within that crowd. I wouldn't have seen them anywhere else. So. Uh, that that's 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 the life effect this place has had for me that <clears throat> okay. straight up um, with your tenure here it's going back 20 years where were we and where are we now and where do you see us going in the future <laughs> <laughs> well the first question is where were we uh, just to keep it brief because of the, we don't need to recitate the whole history of AOC I got the job uh, because my immediate predecessor had been terminated uh, and that immediate predecessor who had been terminated he was given the job because his immediate predecessor had been terminated. It was a big cascading effect of some, uh, some free speech gone wild, so to speak, here in Lafayette. The Ku Klux Klan was doing programming uh, and then the NAACP had a, a, an appropriate and very strong reaction to the Ku Klux Klan. And, and they were uh, carrying on more or less the right kind of uncivil dialogue. They're yelling at each other, but they were doing it on TV and they used AOC, uh, whitey is best, black is best, you know, blah, 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 doing, the, doing what we're here for. And then out of the blue, some people decided to express their First Amendment a little more aggressively and they did another program uh, in the midst of all this contentious dialogue that AOC was hosting. And that program was way over the top and it broke the bubble for AOC. Uh, the, the political arena turned against AOC, the public turned against AOC. Uh, blacks hated us because we had the Klan, the Klan, the whites hated us because we had the blacks. Politicians hated us because of what that other program had done. Uh, and it was devastating to AOC at the time. Uh, the funding rocketed downward and, uh, and they, all the leadership was gone. The board of directors was kind of in disarray and repopulated itself with nine people with nine personal agendas that were plugged into a, a mess. That was what I got the job. I, 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 a longer story, not necessarily for this place, but uh, the job and I met, and uh, it's been kind of a stumble forward. I don't want to take credit, but over time we've gone from that messed up, we had a couple of cameras that we loaned out and three miscolored studio cameras, and we, and we did public access television. That was it. 
and now we do a whole lot more. Uh, we, we, of course, we have TV, podcasting, radio. We loan out all kinds of equipment. We do a lot of community reporting and coverage ourselves. Uh, lots of things that were, were not even thought of back in those days that we're doing now. Uh, the, the public benefits much more than it used to because we have much better facilities. Uh, the staff, uh, you know, I'm looking at a staff that we didn't have before and everybody here is working as a professional now. Back in those days, it was uh, actually my first day on the job and I interviewed everybody on the staff and uh, there were two people were still being paid less than minimum wage and they didn't even know what minimum wage was. So that was kind of what the staff looked like back then. And so now uh, Lafayette has, uh, I think, a world-class, non-commercial, open to everybody, media production facility. They can come down here with emphasis on First Amendment and do just darn near anything they want. Mm -hmm. Did I answer your question at all? For the most part. I gotta remember where we <laughs> <That's> started. <okay. laughs> it's gonna be uh, hard to edit any of that into a couple of stops. That's okay. Um, where do you see AOC 10 years from now? Uh, in the rear view mirror, I'll be gone. Okay. That's cold blooded. <laughs> I don't mean it quite as far like as that. progress. Uh, Actually, what I would, what I, the, and we're uh, in the, we're at the crux of a, a huge evolutionary period for AOC where we are transitioning not from, I guess it's more that we're adding to our initial core purposes, which were a free speech outlet uh, in Lafayette. And that's, that was the core. People came here to use their voice and we had minimal tools, but we gave them massive distribution of their voice. Well, we just want to do that again in the next era. And because tools are more ubiquitous, uh, we're now working much more uh, aggressively in making people competent users of those tools, not just having the tools, but competent users. And we put a huge emphasis on media making the consumer smarter, media literacy. Uh, and in 10 years, I would hope Lafayette uh, has what we have now uh, on steroids, a, a resource that everybody can take advantage of that provides an information uh, distribution uh, hub that other media can't provide. And, and, and we're set up to do that. We're set up for long form gavel to gavel meetings, for example. Uh, no other media can, can do that. They're not set up for that. That's what we can do. So I want to see us doing what we're doing now on steroids. Uh, uh, more of it uh, in, in a uh, the people who take advantage of the facility should be getting a first-rate experience. Awesome. Um, you've gotten to know many of the AOC members throughout the years. Who would you say, maybe in your top three, would be the most influential in your life, professionally and personally? <clears throat> wow, that's a, a, an unexpected question. Uh, the most influential members from here that I have met uh, in no particular order, but the ones that have made the most changes in me personally would be, uh, well, she's gonna hate that I even refer to her as a friend, but my friend, uh, C. F. A. Uh, Khadijah, uh, who happens to be Shahid's wife, uh, she and I have, uh, I have grown a lot because of my fights with her, uh, learned a lot from her. Uh, and then there's a, a, a fellow that has inspired me in a whole lot of ways that I, that, uh, he's a complicated person, but is uh, Bobby Avenue. Uh, Bob has challenges that uh, pale in comparison to everybody else I know, and he handles them very well. Uh, and, and those two have changed me personally and made me think differently. You know, that whole, what would Jesus do? I had sort of a, well, what would the, the, these guys do? Uh, and then another person I met through here who was not specifically a member, but was a board of directors uh, uh, person or whatever participant that was hugely significant on my personal development was John St. Julian, who's, who's passed away. A major influence professionally and personally both. He's close to a, a, a therapist and a mentor and a friend. And the community and, room is named yeah, after him. Yeah, we named him, the community right? room after him at a, uh, because he was all about the community. And, and John was like, whoo-hoo, big deal in my life. Uh, and one other person who should, uh, uh, I should mention is Bobby Ormston, who's also passed away, who was employed here and then uh, became a public school teacher and brought her kids here a whole lot. Bobby uh, was influential uh, because of the, the things I learned from these other people. That, that's, that's the four humans that AOC bestowed upon me that had the biggest personal effect. All right. Um... Well, let's talk about your But I don't want life. them to hear this, that part. You can't, particularly uh, CFA, they'd want to know. Okay. Uh, okay, so. 
I'll, I'll add it down. On a personal level, uh, aside from AOC, who has been the most influential person in your life? <clears throat> I guess I would probably say something like Buddha or Gandhi or something deep and thoughtful, but uh, I have been, my bubble, my nucleus, the people around me, I have really, it's been populated by really supportive and helpful and strategically timed influencers. You know, I had the right girlfriend at the right time. I had the right teacher at the right time. I had the right coach at the right time. I had the right board of director member for the problems I was having at the time. And then the next board of director member, you know, they, the, the evolution of my life has been so many people that have been, and I'm leaving out relatives. I would, if you want to get into the, who's really most, obviously it's my dad and that, I can't even, the, my dad, if you knew him, you would know that that's so given that well, who influences me the most, I can't even mention that. It's just like, you know, yeah. that. But non-relatives, uh, I can't single out anybody. There's just a whole lot of influencers and uh, okay. people that I've related to personally, books I've read and stuff. Yeah. Well, speaking of books, are you currently reading anything right now, or is there anything on your book wish list that you <laughs> would like to tap I am super into? duper embarrassed to admit that I don't think I've done what is referred to as deep reading mm -hmm. probably in a couple of years. It, I, I grew up as a voracious reader. I was at the library a lot, and my family was way into books, and I, I read all the time for pleasure. And then and I think I'm a little bit... Uh, Two things happened. One is that I got the job at AOC, which took 80 hours a week for, for many years, and I had literally no time for reading. Um, and then, about the time I had time for reading again, digital world took over, and I started becoming so short. My conscious, my attention span's only only as long as an article on one page of a website now. So deep reading is not as pleasurable as it used to be because I feel like I should be turning the pages faster. What am mm -hmm. I missing? What about uh, television programs? What's your favorite show? Television is my, my background noise, okay. but if I'm going to sit down and watch it, mm -hmm. I hate to admit this, but probably uh, Project Runway would be. I see you laughing, and I can see the people at <laughs> home. Never I can would see have you all laughing. That. Yeah, Project Runway. Uh, no, I tape it, but I will sit down to watch that because I think oh, it's I did. awesome. Do you watch the All Stars too? Well, I guess it's all the same. Yeah, I can't really it, tell. It, I just right. know if I like these guys or I don't like these guys. One's hosted so. by Alyssa Milano, and the other is Heidi Klum. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Heidi Klum. Well, one's got Tim Gunn in it, and one doesn't. Yes. But anyway, yeah. I, I get off on those things. Okay. Um, and, and anything else that I make it a point to record and watch? Um, nah old school stuff if I'm right. a, I watch Andy Griffith. Well, the, the, the Project Runway answer definitely threw me for a curveball, <laughs> but um, that leads me to my next question. Is there anything about you that um, most people don't know that you'd like to share with us on camera? Yeah. <clears throat> that you can say on that camera. That I would like to share with people yes. on camera. I have three nipples. <laughs> okay. There you go. All right. I don't we think might there's edit any. That out. I don't. I don't know if there's any deeper, darker secret <laughs> that I think the world needs to know. Good. Um, good. <laughs> good. Now you're afraid. You didn't know this was going to go that way, did you? No. No. Okay. I had an idea. Um, what is your favorite uh, musician band um, music that you like to listen to? Um, I typically listen to what you would refer to, I guess, as rock and roll. Mm -hmm. uh, a huge, huge fan of uh, Sonny Landreth. I listen to him all the time. And uh, over time, the bigger influences, Boss Gags was a big deal for me for a while. Back right, right after I got out of the military, uh, Cat Stevens might have even saved what was my sanity at that point. Uh, big influence. But I listened to a, a fairly wide variety of music from when I was uh, uh, 35 or 40. Okay. <laughs> so it's a lot of old rock and roll stuff. and. Uh, uh, fairly diverse, but there's a heavy dose towards the rock and roll and some and blues, Texas blues, stuff like that. Okay. Uh, switching gears for just a second, because you mentioned it, and, and we haven't really spoken about it much, was your military um, experience. Do you want to talk about your um, uh, experience with that? No. Oh, yes. I'll say for the record that um, the whole thing was a charade, and I was taken advantage of, and I would I don't regret that it went. It was hugely beneficial for me to do what I had to do, and to, it, I, I, I grew up. But um, 
the, the whole American public was lied to. Mm -hmm. You're still being lied to. Right. Very aggravating. And just for but the audience to know that you were in this. This is for the audience to know that yeah. the whole Vietnam War was a fraud uh, and the things that are passing for military service right now are about two-thirds fraud. Mm -hmm. It's uh, People get killed every day in the name of Okay. And you can leave that in. All right, I will. Um, changing gears again, um, who is the most famous person that you've ever met, and what was the most interesting thing about them? <laughs> uh, I met Ronald Reagan. Oh, wow. And there was... Nothing Before he was president? Or? He was on a campaign trail and okay. uh, he came and I was the photographer and I got to shake his hand. He asked me what I, he should do about a little problem he was having in the Middle East. And Did I you get a photograph him. with him? No, I took his picture. Oh, you took his picture. Actually, I think there might have been a picture of me with him at some point. But anyway, uh, as far as fame and who did I get to say hello to that's famous, he would be up there, I guess. And, uh, I think he would be. I was in New York last, uh, I didn't meet, Tony Bennett. I bumped into him on the sidewalk. Oh, nice. Literally. <laughs> Excuse me. Uh -huh. I didn't know if I was going to push you out of the way. Uh, <laughs> you know, I don't know. I guess along the way, um, I met Boss Gax. He was a big deal. Mm -hmm. Not, not all that famous unless you're a fan. Yeah, yeah. Um, I don't know. Edwin Edwards count. He's famous. Oh, yeah. Everybody in Louisiana has met Edwin Edwards, though. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Have you met him? I've met him. I'm friends with his wife, Trina, on Facebook. And, and he is, he's on Facebook, too. Oh, yeah? Did he yeah. ever gamble at your, uh, your casino when you went there? <laughs> uh-huh. Okay. We don't want to talk about that. No. Nope. Huh? The professional ethics. <laughs> That's right. I forgot everything I knew from that business. Okay. <laughs> um, do you uh, work with any other charities in the community right no. now or serve on any I'm, uh And in fact, if anybody's watching and you need a volunteer or a board member or somebody who thinks he knows everything, I'm more than happy to participate. <laughs> uh, and I give most of my, my service to the community now. I give uh, is benefit to AOC is that I record a lot of events for other nonprofits. Uh, mm -hmm. I probably did 40 nonprofit recordings last year. Uh, but I'm not on any boards. I've gotten off of everything. Um, over time, I was on quite a few, but uh, no, no. Right now, I'm not on any boards to, at okay. all. Hope that's true. <laughs> <laughs> um, if you won the lottery tomorrow, what would you do with the money? Pretty much have a plan already to give most of it away. Really? Uh, yeah, I've got my list made up. Who's going to get some? Who are your favorite? Charities, do you want to say? It's not going to be probably charities as you oh, would okay. think of them. I'm going to give a lot to um, groups of individuals, people ah, that have AOC touched me. AOC staff members? AOC staff members would come into money. Uh, <laughs> everybody that I know who has children who need a real education, those educations would be provided for. Uh, I had a uh, I had an experience that, that had a big effect on me when a uh, Buddhist monks lived with me for a, a, a week at the house, and I promised them if I ever won the lottery that I would send money to their monastery. Okay. In, well, uh, well in let's India. talk about that for a minute. When did that happen? And that was one of those quirks where I, you know, I was in the right place at the right time. Okay. Uh, and there were there were nine monks and a and a translator coming to Lafayette to build a mandala. You know, a sand mandala, this big ceremonial thing with a build out an artistic thing and. It was a big deal, and they, need, and they needed host houses. And my wife and I were at a place that we would never have gone, but we had to be there making small talk with other people who felt like us. And these other people said, we have to leave town, and we're going to have to give up our, our hosting responsibilities. We have three monks coming. Do you know anybody that would put up three monks from, from a monastery in Dramsala? We'll do it. And lo and behold, Three, nine monks show up, and then uh, Cheryl and I, and then the other host families, Michael Doucet and Sharon, were the Beausoleil guy, and then another couple uh, who had a son at Princeton. Uh, we met these monks, took three each, and then they lived with us for a week, and we got together, and during the day they did this mandala. And that was that was big deal. That was, you know, when you travel, you meet other people. Well, mm -hmm. the same thing happens when other people come to your house. Sure. But when you get three monks straight from India, Actually, the curious part, they weren't straight from India. They had stopped in Mexico and were doing, they did a, a week in Mexico and we were their second stop on their U.S. tour. <laughs> and they, they, there's almost no English at all. Wow. 
Huh. And we, we met him in, in, a, in a group, uh, and, and I was nervous. You know, I don't know how to talk to these people. I'm doing all this stuff thinking, you know, uh, I gotta, I gotta make sure there's no yaks around or anything. I don't know what you do with uh, Buddhist monks. Uh, and they were eating frickin' McDonald's and, <laughs> and stuff. And, uh, blah, 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 talking to each other. And we got our three and we head out and we get to the house and we're walking in. And the first thing they say, we're just barely in the door, CNN, CNN. They wanted to watch the news because there was some going ons in India. I uh, don't remember specifically who was doing what, but they were tearing down some old iconic religious artifacts in India. And they were all about getting to CNN so they could see what's going on back in India. Uh, and then they they cooked for us. We cooked for them. We did a whole lot of chanting and stuff. And uh, the older the the Leshe, the the big shot of the whole bunch, uh, he couldn't speak a word of English. But we had the translator who was pretty good. Uh, just blew me away with some observations and things he said. And uh, these guys exuded a life and an attitude that I still aspire to. I want to, I want to, what, what would, uh, what would uh, Keldon or what would Tinley, Tinley was the one that, that we bonded with him. What would Tinley do? Uh, big deal. So I had, I had monks at the house. You started that with a question. I don't know. I did. It. <laughs> That's okay. We segued, but it, it went into a very good, good place. Speaking of places, if you could travel anywhere in the world, where would you go and why? Um, I have been able to travel a little bit, and I really can't tell you how big a deal it is to get to travel. You should, everybody should do that. Mm -hmm. uh, and I would go just about anywhere you want. My wife's trying to get me to go to Canada right now. She wants to go to Toronto or Quebec, so that'd probably be my next stop. Okay. Uh, and if I won that lottery, the money that I don't give away, I'd use some of it. Probably do some stuff in uh, Asia. I haven't, I've, I've only been to Japan on the way to Vietnam. I you know, I like to tour. Mm -hmm see some of that great great um all right now i'm going to ask you a, a question that you might have to think about the answer but if you could have dinner with someone living or deceased who would it be and why and it can be more than one person oh it'd be my mom in a heartbeat okay yeah and who she wouldn't? passed away oh yeah about 10 years ago 10 years yeah, and who, ago pff, that's a done deal but uh you know, sitting around the table, would I have Abraham Lincoln? And mm -hmm. uh, I'd probably go for, go for, for anybody, I'd go for the Buddha, the original. Uh, let him tell me how it all went down. Gotcha. Let's make this a fun answer. Buddha and Jesus. <laughs> I'd have some of both of them to talk to. Okay. You know? Great. I can talk to almost anybody. Buddha you would could. do. You could. Do you have any fears or phobias? Oh, hell yeah. <laughs> what are they? Uh, this being discovered that this is all a, you know, a giant illusion, <laughs> yeah, that's nuts. No, it's uh, a big conspiracy, <clears throat> Ed. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm a yeah. I'm, that I don't really exist. I'm a figment of somebody else's imagination. Um, I have a little bit of a thing about heights that uh, okay. uh, I don't. I don't like heights too much. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not afraid of snakes or spiders. I prefer not to deal with that kind of you know the stuff people are typically afraid of, but. Uh, I'm a little bit afraid of being in front of a camera. This is a little nerve wracking. Uh, <laughs> strange to be on the other end. It's right? strange to be on the other end. Yeah. Well, speaking of fears and phobias, have you ever had, looking back in your life, have you ever had a near death experience and grateful to be alive after it, it happened? Not, well, not to the extent that um, some people that I know have had, but. Um, I mean, I stuck my finger in a light plug one time that could have killed me, you know. Uh, I got through the whole Vietnam experience without getting killed. Mm -hmm. um, That's an accomplishment. But that, no, I, I mean, I was in some car wrecks that other people were severely injured in, but I wasn't even, I just walked away. Uh, but no. Uh, I, Do you I've think never, that's luck or divine intervention? I am a, probably the luckiest person you've ever known. Okay. I. I'm serious. When I you ask who has influenced me, it's I've had the right influence at the right time. I am just a lucky person. I'm surrounded by the right energy. I got the right people working with me here. I was born of the right people. I only haven't won a lottery because I don't buy the tickets often enough. But I'm confident that I will. If, if a lottery is the right answer, I I, I get what I need. I, it, and maybe the universe hasn't decided I need to win the lottery. But I've got love, I've got housing, I've got a family, I've got 
fruitful employment that has a purpose in society. Mm -hmm. You know, I got it going on. And you man. mentioned your family. Tell us a little bit about your family. Born in the age of Ozzie and Harriet. <laughs> Mom and dad played Ozzie and Harriet. They had three boys. I was the oldest. Um, um, as middle as Ozzie and Harriet as a family could grow up, only we were not quite as wealthy. Our house wasn't as big. We didn't have the, the big car and everything. But uh, it, what would pass for normal middle America, I lived it. Uh, mm -hmm. Mom and dad both believed in education. Uh, born in the South, grew up in the 60s uh, in Mississippi and then in New Orleans. Uh, uh, my parents kind of kept me of oh, what I would call on the right side of society. You know, we were liberal in a super duper crazy conservative area and they, they were, they subtly made me aware of, of the kind of stuff out in the world. Uh, and then as we, we grew up, we all took off and then I got a brother, two in New Orleans now, one in New Orleans, one on the North Shore. Mm -hmm. uh, and then I'm here in Lafayette. Mom passed away, dad's 96 and uh, Super duper healthy, doing very well, living by himself, taking care of business. Mm -hmm. and I came from good stuff. I lucked out again. Right. And your wife, and you have several children. Right? My my wife is one of those. Another lucky thing. I was uh, don't to get too far into it, but I was in a real bad place, and she figured she could save me, and has spent the last close to twenty five years saving me, uh, keeping me sane, keeping me. There, I'm only here because of her. I'll just be honest with you. Well, we you. thank I mean, her for that. Yeah, mm -hmm. well, you can thank her. Her curse it depends on, <laughs> on how well you know me. Okay. <laughs> but she's a, a, a remarkable woman, and her family is in, incredibly good people. I mean, they just heart of gold, pure, good people. Uh, they're all from Texas, so there's a little bit of problem there, uh, the Texas thing. I'm just kidding. No, but uh, another another lucky happenstance just bloop, fell into it. Gotcha. And, uh, I want to mention too that I have two good kids. Mm -hmm. One at Mississippi State teaches. Mother of my grandchildren got two of those two boys, and then my son is a photographer for the Morning Advocate here in town. Oh, is he? And uh, yeah, and a roadie, and he he works a casino video gig stuff nice. like that. Yeah, Very you'll meet nice. him around here. He comes every now and then. Wonderful. Well, looking back on your life, uh, personally or professionally, what achievement are you most proud of? <laughs> Damn. What achievement am I most proud of? Mm -hmm. Outside of my kids, uh, which was really their mother's achievement, um, it's going to sound strange to you, but the thing I'm happiest about, and it's just the thing that marks this, is that all of my employees uh, are professionally treated professionally. Uh, they have as reasonable as you can get in a nonprofit, and that that makes them capable of providing good service to the community. So that the achievement for me is that what other people are doing that I'm able to help them get there. And I marked that by the day I was able to provide health insurance. Uh, a lot of our people here didn't have any opportunity to have it or get it paid for either one. So I think the day I could say we can provide health insurance or not, uh, and you, that was a big deal. So gotcha. there you go. That's my crowning star. All right. Taking care of my staff. All right. Well, we're going to wrap up with just two more questions. How would you like to be remembered? <clears throat> I am stunned. Does everybody get this kind of question? Yeah. Is that the regular answer? Yep. No, the... I'm grilling you a little harder. <laughs> How would I like to be remembered? Yes. Probably more favorably than I'm thought of now in life. I have no answer to that. I don't. Okay. No. If you remember me at all, I'll say this to the audience. <laughs> if you remember me at all, uh, I don't know why. Thanks for that. Okay. You know, we're all dust in the wind, man. It's even, you know. And if you could pick out um, your epitaph, what would be on your tombstone? What words would you put on there? Bite me. <laughs> Bite me, yeah. No, the, I, um, I have thought about this one. I actually have, and I can't give you an answer because it depends on where I'm at at the time. I'm, but bite me is what sprung out of my pie hole at that moment. Uh, but it might be something akin to I told you, or you look around you. D
<laughs> or something. Uh, this ain't real. This is this dying stuff is real, or some. It'd be something sarcastic, uh, in in a high, something that would be an in your. Uh, it wouldn't be polite. Gotcha. Well, Sarcast. It'd be a sarcastic. Last one. Describe yourself in three words. Fat white guy. <laughs> Well, thank you, Ed Bowie. It's been a pleasure. <laughs> You're very welcome, Webby Maddie. And you too, Mary. <laughs>